Good afternoon now. Um, welcome to um, this series about leadership. It's really a conversation that all of us here um, actually will be sort of eavesdropping. We have the privilege to listen in on a very interesting conversation about a very important topic. Um, what I'd like to share first is that you know the World Economic Forum as an institution, is, we set out to help leaders learn, but we often don't spend enough time to understand really how did leaders get there? What was their personal journey? Um, and in, the, in this regard, we have really two really great stories that we'll hear from today, a conversation that really is anchored fundamentally around uh, the question of discovery, curiosity, science, I think, uh, as you'll know in a moment. And it's very apropos that we're doing this at our annual meeting of new champions, where the focus is really around uh, science, technology, innovation, and really how does that all serve the needs of society. So I have the great pleasure um, to welcome and to introduce uh, a co-chair of this annual meeting of new champions, uh, Enes Abuhamed, who is uh, not only an eminent scholar in, in the sense, but also an entrepreneur, um, who is the co-founder and CEO of uh, H2Go Power. Um, and she'll be joined by actually a former co-chair of this meeting itself as well, uh, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, who is the president of the European Research Council, which you probably all aware is, is really the premier funding uh, funder of science uh, globally, not just in Europe. And I'm really excited about this uh, discussion because I know that uh, when you st you're here today as leaders, but when the journey started, you're just very curious people who's devoted a lot of time at university and such, really looking at really interesting questions, right? It's about knowledge, that pursuit of knowledge. Um, but today, we're going to ask you to sort of put on your wisdom hat. So the short, short way I look at it is, you know, knowledge is what we put in our minds, but then in a way, the wisdom is what we start to take out of it. And so we're delighted to be part of this conversation. And uh, we are also really excited that in this series on leadership, that we're actually going to hear from you as citizens, of course, of the world, but also uh, your journey as leaders from the perspective of the science community, which I think is very, very relevant, of course, in this age of the fourth industrial revolution. So I'm gonna turn the conversation over to the two of you. and. Uh, we look forward to uh, where you take us with your stories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee, for the kind introduction. And hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so uh, I am a representative to the young scientist community uh, here at the World Economic Forum. And today, our conversation about leadership 4.0 uh, has to do a lot with science and research and hunting for evidence before making uh, decisions and therefore this is how we can basically expect responsible leadership. So uh, just as a brief introduction of why we need to talk about responsible leadership and in the context of leadership uh, 4.0 in the uh, fourth industrial uh, revolution age, uh, it is because we have got many decisions wrong if we look at, around and uh, look at uh, threatening problems and crises that we have uh, around, and my generation has inherited problems like climate change, for example, uh, how do we deal with it now when we should have listened to scientists in the 50s when they said there is climate change crisis coming? And I'd like to start by um, asking you, Jean-Pierre, a question terms of, so we have a growing population uh, from 7 billion to 11 billion expected by the end of the century. Uh, we have a rising problems and many of them are going to be solved by a scientific invention. How do we increase the ratio of people who can solve problems to people who have these problems? So we uh, make more responsible uh, decisions and help leaders to, be, uh, to become more responsible? Well, actually, you are asking a very difficult question. Um, one thing I tend to say as a scientist, we have, to, of course, to speak up and claim that we can do some things, but we also have to be very careful not to oversell. That is to claim the, to do things that we cannot do. I'm sure that the problems you are addressing, uh, you are mentioning, is uh, very critical for the future, in particular in view of an uh, increasing population, um, will require actually scientific solutions. 
uh, but at the same time, it will not be possible without the proper implementation by many people. And this can only be achieved, and that's part of the uh, new uh, equation, that uh, the level of education has to increase worldwide. And not only increase in quantity, but also in autonomy of thinking. I think it uh, will be more and more important that people can really by themselves uh, convince that uh, in a sense even some things could become constraints on people that uh, things that you used to do you will not do them because you you are conscious that they will co go in the wrong direction and so one has to manage by I think the only way will be education to really get uh, the support of people because they realize that uh, really in order to face some difficulties, that uh, you identified some, uh, actually, or to implement some solutions which are proposed. Uh, for example, if you talk about energy, which is your speciality, of course, uh, most likely we will need more energy, but we, know, no, we also know that the quality of energy we're producing has to be different. But also maybe people have to know that they have to moderate their use of energy. And how do you do that uh, in, a, in a good way, that is without people feeling uh, really so much constraint that they refuse and in the end they prefer to follow people who give advice to ignore the problem. And of course we know very well now that if we ignore this problem they will become totally insurmountable and then will become really real threats. So I think this is this combination. And so why is uh, 4.0 important? Because definitely today we, we know that the connectivity of the world has increased fantastically. Uh, that the access uh, to information has improved remarkably. But at the same time, uh, I'm not sure that people have been prepared for that. So for the moment, it's more a deluge of information and people have a lot of difficulty of uh, discriminating in this information what is relevant, what is irrelevant, what is true, what is wrong. And I think uh, I'm coming back to my issue on education. I think uh, education has to play a much more significant role in training the next generations in being able to face this and to really, uh, well, at the same time cultivate the curiosity but also cultivate the level of responsibility of people. If we cannot man manage to do that, and I think we have the tools to do that, but it, may, it means a long-term effort and really a willingness of uh, governments over the planet to look for a more educated, uh, more ed educated population. As you know, one of the very stable laws in terms of, for example, uh, the growth of population is if you increase the level of knowledge of women, then you decrease the, the, the number of uh, children they have, actually. Uh, still a significant number because we need the population to really develop properly, but uh, this is uh, very well known. So I think uh, without uh, we have to use these new tools to really make uh, education more efficient and people more by themselves, self, uh, having a better capacity of deciding. So now, concerning your area, which is energy, do you, what do you see the future of energy? How can energy be transformed in a way which contributes to the challenge that you raised? So uh, uh, it's a very big question. That I've been thinking about it the past 10 years of my life. Uh, I'm not sure I have a full answer or a, a full fir formula for that. I'm sure also so many uh, world re leaders and leaders in the energy industry uh, have a full, clear, clear answer uh, for that for many reasons. Uh, first, as I mentioned, the challenge of demand increasing the population is growing uh, and the other challenge from the um, a, a, a other side around the way we are used to generate energy, which is polluting uh, with the emissions that we produce, and the way as users we are used to consume energy. In some parts of the world, we don't have access to, uh, to energy. In some other parts of the world, we leave the house and leave the, the lights on. So, uh, um, First, there isn't, uh, there isn't uh, uh, one formula that would work in Nigeria and in the US that would apply for, for everyone, that we would say, we need a better system, we're gonna follow this uh, manual, and then uh, we have uh, one problem that we, we solved within, uh, with, with a manual with, or with one formula. 
So uh, that's a challenge. We have to look at different areas in the world and see uh, where the areas that are, uh, um, for example, they don't have a, a lot of access to power and understand that if we want to introduce power to these areas, we have to take into account what's going on in this region or if we go to uh, places where they have options to implement renewable energy, they can afford the cost of that, they can afford to work with zero emission uh, and uh, educate and train their uh, customers to be more efficient when they consume energy. So they reduce their carbon footprint and carbon emissions. Um, we do it this way in one part of the world, we do it differently in other parts of the world. So uh, there is an energy transition movement. We have to move to a more efficient uh, energy system, a much cleaner system, and really uh, look at uh, uh, the, our carbon footprint because it's gonna come back at us. And, and uh, if we don't solve this, climate change is our biggest enemy. Another question is, uh, so you are in a position now where you really were trained in the academic world, but now you move to be an entrepreneur. Um, how was this transition possible? I mean, who, was this your uh, decision very early on, where even you were a little girl, or you just, just happened that uh, uh, at some point you felt that uh, the right way of developing what you wanted to do was to get out in some, some sense of the academic system? Uh, it was a completely unplanned journey. Uh, so uh, I was doing uh, my PhD back in the days um, and I was really interested in the topic that I was researching uh, as a typical scientist. As I thought that my, my research meant the whole world for me because that's where I spent most of the time, the lab, doing my experiments. Uh, I was working on an, an energy-related research and um, I didn't necessarily know what problem is solved. And then um, I was invited to go to uh, Africa and give a talk about my research results. Uh, I went there and um, that was the first time I realized actually that there are people in the world who don't have control over the switch. It's not like a matter of clicking it on and off. They, uh, they uh, basically work around when the sun is out and, and, and they, that's basically the, their most efficient hours. Uh, I realized that there are hospitals in some part of the world who run out of power because of, uh, you know, they run out of diesel and then that means that they cannot do operations. And I, I was started to think that, you know what, this exciting research is not going to solve a problem unless I design it in a way where we take the learnings from the research and we do something about it. So if we can work on a product that could be introduced to, especially people in the developing world, to solve a real problem, I think that's where, in my opinion, my science could, could be um, um, purposed uh, in, in a best, it, it could be positioned in the best way. And uh, this is what I wanted to do from, from, that, from that point, from that trip. Like my, perspective about what I wanted to contribute to as a scientist uh, changed. I, I really saw the value in acting like an entrepreneur. Very good. But uh, do you find this uh, new uh, involvement uh, fundamentally different from the one you had before? Or is, it, uh, um, is your life a different life now that you are doing this? Or? Um, yes, so um, uh, my, my responsibilities are very different. Um, um, I, I am not the person who is doing the research anymore. I am not the, uh, the solo inventor. Uh, I am the person who think about the team and how basically we can bring in the best person in the best area so we can structure a business together because it's, a, it's, a, it's a putting an operation unit where many different people can contribute to different sides of the business is very different than the job of, of, of a scientist who look at specific problem and, and try to come up with a, a, a study that solves that. But, so, you, you are at this stage of your life where you have already achieved something quite remarkable in developing a, a company. Um, how do you see the, the future for that? Is that uh, you, you would like at some point come back to academia, or uh, is, um, do you see, do you have an idea about that? Or you just expect things will just 
happen and uh, yeah so um, um, I do have two umbrellas, one of a scientist and, and uh, the second one of an entrepreneur. I, I obviously spend um, almost all my time uh, uh, under the hat of, uh, of the entrepreneur. Um, I don't know if, uh, if, uh, if I have a short-term plan to go back to academia. Uh, because I have started a journey that I'd really like to continue uh, as an entrepreneur and try and uh, amplify the impact that a scientific product could make uh, as a product when we introduce it to uh, many people, even if they don't have the ability to understand the scientific depth behind it, they will be able to use it and benefit from it. So uh, I really like that mission and I think I'd like to, to, to continue on this journey. But at the same time, um, sharing knowledge and sharing my experience um, without teaching people about, like, you know, this is a formula. You take the formula, you apply it to something, and it works this way. This is expected. Uh, uh, I, I, might, I might be able to, to go back to uh, share, share my experience and, and, and knowledge um, as academic, give lectures and, and stuff like that. So the, the title of our session contains 4.0. So in a sense, it is related to the um, new world in which we live, which has a lot of uh, data available and a lot of decisions are made on data uh, with the consequence that uh, actually we are under deluge of uh, information. Mm -hmm. And the key point for, I'm sure, in your profession, but also in, in my situation, is to analyze this data and uh, retain only the ones which are reliable but also relevant for, for what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I want to do something else, I will use other data. So uh, how do you see the, the, the capacity of the world to really move in this environment? Again, I'm touching to what I said about education, that also this is something for which presently, at least if I look at the French system, I'm a Frenchman, the education system is not training students to, or even young, young students, to really discriminate between the information is information. So you have to learn, I think it's more and more important now to learn and to, to discriminate between relevant information, between uh, reliable information. Do you think there is uh, something uh, which is needed in this area or whether it will just solve by itself that uh, uh, unreliable uh, uh, information is going to die by itself or how do you see the future of this? Because this is a new dimension for which I think uh, many systems have not been prepared. And uh, in particular, even the scientific community, of course, is benefiting fantastically from this access to, to information, yeah. access to data. But at the same time, um, uh, are we um, uh, mastering it in the right way? That is, uh, how do we train our students in the best way to use this information? Yeah, so obviously we have introduced uh, something new to our system, so we need to really train the system to work efficiently with uh, all the data and access to information that we have. So um, uh, uh, a child now doesn't have to go to uh, competitions or even to, uh, to school to learn about a topic. They can Google it and they can um, make basically their own curriculum of something that they are, of things that they are interested in, so access to information. Is, uh, can make our learning much more uh, advanced. Now, the question of is all the access, uh, the accessible uh, knowledge, is it good? And because it's accessible, uh, shall we really uh, go ahead and uh, and get what we like? You know, accept what we get, even if we, if we what we get is packaged with uh, with the wrong type of knowledge that we actually should not access and we should not know, and we should not really introduce to. Uh, definitely we need measures and controls to make sure that when we are training researchers, when we are training students, when we are training kids to access knowledge, uh, they don't exceed uh, their capacity of absorbing a certain type of information, and it's uh, monitored in a way that you know we don't really play with their, like brainwash them or give them wrong impressions of the word. So we can really like use the knowledge in a very positive way and, and, and make advancements rather than, you know, be easily accessible and get ra radicalized. And these are, these are one of the, the problems that we've seen. Um, and, uh, and 
I really hope that we can really focus uh, on trying to get the right measures uh, in place to, uh, to tackle this issue. One thing I, I've seen in my own life uh, very important is to seize opportunities when they come and very often they uh, come at the moment you don't expect them. Uh, for myself, for example, uh, I've been a mathematician in my life and at some point I was in charge of, uh, of a committee to select uh, mathematicians in France at the CNRS and I was not expecting to chair this committee. I was too young to do that. But the person who was supposed to do that just didn't get elected, so there was somebody missing. And then all of a sudden people fell on me by saying you should do that. And uh, actually I hesitated a lot because I, I didn't feel I was prepared. But at some point I decided to take, the take on the challenge and try to do it, which of course resulted in my obligation because of this new function, which I didn't, was not prepared for, uh, to really broaden my landscape, also to be able to uh, defend my field towards uh, other disciplines, which mm -hmm. I had never done before. So uh, I think uh, in terms of leadership, uh, very often these kind of um, unexpected moments but, and then you have, uh, that you have to face and you have to say yes or no yes. Uh, are extremely important. Did you face uh, similar situations or do you think it's something uh, for everybody to, to think about? That is to say, if this happens to me, what do I do? Um, so um, I think everyone's career in many ways uh, like develop in ways that they don't, they don't plan it. Um, and sometimes... Um, maybe in the old generation, uh, people did choose what they wanted to study, they did choose a job, and if they didn't choose to change it, um, they, they stayed on the job um, for, for many years. But um, I think my, my generation r represent, um, uh, because there are so many opportunities now around us, you cannot plan your journey accurately. You cannot say, I'm gonna study this and then do this, and this is a job that I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. So in my case, I did not plan my journey. I thought, and when I, when I was doing a PhD, I was thinking about the PhD, I really had no idea what I'm going to do afterwards. I thought that I was going to get a job in an energy company. I did not think that I'm going to start an energy company myself. I, I definitely did not have any plan or imagine that this is what I'm going to do. And uh, when we officially registered the company, I remember we did that because we got a European Commission grant <laughs> and that uh, uh, when I took the, the check to the bank, uh, they said uh, you need to register a company and then we will create a bank account. So we registered a company. That was the, the, the catalyst of starting a company, really, like, and starting to do it. Uh, maybe even then, like, at, at, um, at some point, I thought that by the time I finish my PhD, we'll probably shut the company down, and I'll go find a job. And obviously, things did not go according to plan, because we're still growing. Uh, but but it, it's been an incredible journey, and I could not have planned it. But in a sense, what you said is that to start a company, you got some public support. And so how do you see this, the future of a relation between public and private? Because I think the new uh, world, the 4.0, is a world in which clearly, I mean, uh, a lot has to be, uh, correspond to long-term investments. Mm -hmm. Some long-term investments can be done by the public sector, but some others are also done by the private sector. So how do you see the interface between the two? Uh, such a great question, and I'd really like to share my experience with the, with the audience. I mean, I can see like an inter international uh, audience here. So the, the investment world work, I mean, the private investment world work in a way that investors are mostly focused on short-term returns. And uh, any uh, uh, business proposition gets funded if it gets, if it ticks a few boxes and it might be like the simplest idea that gets funding and it might be like the most fascinating idea that solves a big problem that won't get funded by private money because of the process that takes to develop it because of how long the return cycle could be. And that's where public funding comes uh, uh, into the picture and it will have an instrumental role to push 
hardware energy technologies, for example, that are very, very needed to reduce carbon emissions. But you cannot develop them without a lot of money. And especially like at the initial um, phases of the business, if we did not have public support, and I'm talking from experience, we would have not existed by now uh, because private investors did see the long journey and they did not find that appealing. We were competing on the same pots of money with people who generated businesses that could be uh, uh, productized and introduced to user within six months, whereas the development cycle of a hardware energy business could take more than five years. So you, you see this in, in your case, for example, if you didn't have this public support, you would not have been in, able to develop your, your company. Is that um, yeah. a correct understanding? Yes, uh, absolutely not. It wouldn't have been possible without public support. And uh, uh, Europe is, is doing extremely well on that front. Obviously, we can always improve and, and do more. But there are many other countries and many other continents where public support is not available and the potential of innovation and scientific inventions and contributions, scaling solutions like that, doesn't get the same chance, doesn't get the same shot because of the lack of public funding. And uh, I really hope that this is something that could be introduced to places where it's not available in, so everyone in the world could really benefit from innovation that pops in one area. So we have only three minutes, so what would be your conclusion? or advice you would give to leaders of the next generation? Um, so uh, I'd like to go back to my message as a co-chair for this meeting and say that there is a lot of value in scientists and their contribution to the decision-making process. If we are able to find a system where we increase how much contribution we can take from scientists and how to turn to the scientific community uh, to capture validation, uh, hunt for evidence before we make decision. Because decisions, especially political decisions, corporate decisions, they are long-term uh, uh, decisions that are very difficult to reverse once they are made. If we can make them based on evidence, we will have more confidence that we're making the right decision. And this is what responsible uh, leadership uh, could be and should be in the fourth industrial revolution. Well, if you allow me to draw my own conclusion for, for this uh, discussion, I think for me, uh, one thing I've seen all my life as a scientist, but also in uh, positions uh, I've, uh, I've had, in particular, I was director of an institute, but also president of Europe, European Research Council has been really what makes the difference are people. So I think we have always to be extremely careful in choosing people, in giving people opportunities, and uh, that to make sure that we design systems in which people are really coming up with their really most daring ideas. Because taking risk is uh, not uh, spontaneously what the institutions tend to do. Mm -hmm. They tend to be very protective. They tend to really look for the worst when actually they should look for the best. And actually, uh, this is something which uh, is uh, very important to uh, when you do, uh, when you design a system, and ERC was a system which was designed after a long struggle, uh, that you make sure that you are not, uh, because of the way you conceive the whole system, you put yourself in a situation where actually you, you don't get the, the right people to want to work with you. And actually, the privilege of my function has been to meet so many fantastic uh, people with a lot of uh, ambitious ideas, taking risk. And I think we have to be careful that in uh, many areas, uh, this uh, risk taking is really taken seriously uh, because I think uh, spontaneously the organization tend to limit the risk, which at some point I understand why, but uh, it could have the negative effect that actually you push away the people you would like actually to attract. So it's very important to create the conditions when you attract the, the right people. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure much. exchanging with you. Pleasure Thank you, Ness. Thank you, you Jean-Pierre. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, so just in conclusion, um, you know, many of us in the room are, are parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and such. And I think you know, one thing we're drumming in our head is the importance of, in the future, STEM and the fourth industrial revolution. But I think you, break, you, know, you articulated and, and I think revealed to us another dimension to that. 
and that it's really a journey and, and, and for us to, to really help that next generation enable that and also the role of the public sector and the private sector working out, which is very much at the heart of the forum. So thank you for letting us listening on this very interesting conversation. Thank you again. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you, Lee. Thank you.